Yeah, yeah. Let me let me ask you a few questions then. Sure. So um, you're the producer of The Last Ice, and that's quite an incredible and comprehensive film about the fate of the Arctic, uh, climate change, global commerce and politics. How did you begin the film and what what inspired you as a person to gain a, a, a larger view of all of this? So the film actually began, I work for an ocean conservation initiative with uh, National Geographic called Pristine Seas. And what we do with them is we go around the world on expedition and we make 30 to 40 minute documentaries. We have a science team who uh, creates baseline surveys of the marine area. And then we push for policy to have uh, marine protected areas created. Now, about five years ago, my boss, Enrique Sala, who's the marine ecologist who began the program, uh, said we should start looking to the Arctic, find out if there's anything we can do up there to support any efforts. And so when we started doing our preliminary research, I mean, it became obvious right away, this needs to be a feature. This isn't like the other places we go that are kind of self-contained. The Arctic is just um, obviously a much, much bigger story and a much it's going to be a much bigger and more epic uh, thing to communicate to an audience. So that's how the idea to make a feature came about. Now, when we started, it was kind of a, a straight ahead um, uh, wildlife and sea ice story. It was the, you know, sad polar bear drifting off on the lone piece of ice with the tear coming down, that sort of thing. And then, you know, the sea ice is disappearing. But that all went out the window on our first trip, because that's when we started uh, in Inuit communities and filming. And, and really, it started with uh, going out on the ice with Inuit guides. And I think within the first week, it was everyone decided this, this needs to be a film about people, because that's what this story is actually about. Um, you know, there's tens of thousands of Inuit who live across the Arctic. And the area that we were focusing on, the reason the film's called The Last Ice is because there's an area called The Last Ice Area. And that is the, the ocean between Nunavut, Canada and Greenland, which is where the last summer sea ice is predict predicted uh -huh. to be in 2040 before we lose all the summer sea ice. And so as the sea ice is melting toward this one area, all of the, the wildlife is starting to migrate toward it and concentrate in this really uh, dense section of the Arctic, which Inuit, of course, rely on wildlife for subsistence hunting. Uh, they rely on the ice for transportation. It's uh, tied in culturally. It's tied to food security. So it's this extremely uh, uh, you know, invaluable, but also um, fragile area. So then, as we started to tell the story of that area uh, and we started to speak to more and more Inuit, um, it, it, the entire uh, context of all of the present moment started to unfold. So everything from uh, the historical mistreatment and very recent and ongoing uh, mistreatment of Inuit by outsiders, colonizers, uh, governments, um, industry, even a, a history of uh, filmmakers um, mistreating. Um, all of that colored what was happening now. And then, uh, of course, as the ice is melting and you have lots of um, economic drivers and geopolitical drivers for people to come into the same area, uh, the future is looking um, rather uh, bleak. So being able to, and sorry, this is a very long answer to your question. Sure. But no, it's uh, quite a good answer. So so being able to um, put all of these things into context, but also to offer uh, maybe a like a solution, an achievable, uh, a tangible solution to an overwhelming problem. The overwhelming problem being climate change and the tangible solution uh, in the film being protecting this one area, the Pikialasorswak, uh, which is a co-managed area proposal between Inuit and Greenland and the Nunavut. Um, that is an actual uh, tangible solution uh, in the Arctic that will provide um, a sustainable uh, livelihood and, and sustainable culture for Inuit, which I think is something that's been missing from climate change documentaries. Um, you know, I think the, the sort of elephant in the room is that even if you 
uh, hit all the numbers from the Paris Accord, the Paris Agreement, and you uh, reduce emissions and everything, the time scales of reversing the ice loss are generational. I mean, that's just not going right. to happen. So if you're looking at the reality of what's happening today with the ice melting very quickly, uh, I think it's, it's good to focus on solutions that can be put in place right now that are realistic and most importantly are supported by uh, the indigenous groups that actually live in the areas that are going to be most affected. Well, you very effectively dealt with the issue of environmental justice, you know, broadly defined. And uh, that's not often done in films accurately and well. And also the, the impacts to the lifestyle, you know, to the life ways would be a better word to use, right? And you started with um, Alec uh, Peary, who had gone to uh, Denmark with his family and then returned. So there was this reflection on what it means to belong to the land. And he wanted to resume hunting and become a hunter. And so we see it was very artfully done as a director, you know, to see his struggle with his physical um, ailment, his body and his dreams, you know, kind of paralleled against the struggle of the Arctic itself, you know, to, to live, you know, and to, to maintain, uh, uh, maintain uh, traditions, traditional life ways. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, one of uh, the things with Alec uh, that was so great for us was that he was just so open and he was so willing to share his story and, uh, you know, as a counterbalance to him, of course, we also had Motley in uh, Nunavut. Mm -hmm. And both young people, both young Inuit who are trying to figure out what their future is, but their stories, as, as you've seen in the film, are very similar. Both left the Arctic when they were young, both have returned, both are in some way trying to reclaim uh, their cultural heritage and identity, but also um, look to you know the realities of what the future is going to be. Of course, for Alec trying to be a hunter, the the changing ice is much more of an immediate uh, threat to him. Um, he can't be taught in the same ways. He's learning from his uncle, but his uncle can't teach him how to read the ice, and he can't teach him how to read the weather because it's not acting in the way it has predictably for uh, you know generations and. Um, there's less and less hunters in where he lives in Connick and Greenland. There's less and less young people who want to become hunters. Um, so it's, it's not just, uh, you know, a threat of climate change. It's also a threat of, of cultural loss. And of course, if you trace the line back in Greenland, they were uh, colonized by Denmark, uh, you know, a few right. generations prior to when Nunavut was uh, colonized by, by Canadians, but um, I, there's still a, a historical legacy there. And then on the other side, um, in Nunavut in Canada, Matali is also trying to reclaim her identity, but it's, it's almost more of an, an existential threat. Um, mm -hmm. she, there's much more of an immediacy of colonization on the Canadian side. As you saw in the film, this isn't the uh, 19th century. This was one generation ago. I mean, there's a woman in the film in her 50s who was saying that she remembers living a traditional life growing up and then being taken away. This is not ancient history. This is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything being turned completely on its head uh, very, very recently. And they were but, taken away, just to interject, uh, she was taken away because of defense concerns. Is that correct? Like Cold War wanting to populate areas that have lines of sight out to what submarines may be doing out in the water and things like that? So the original, um, in Canada and Nunavut, the original sort of um, round of colonization really had to do with sovereignty and land claims. And that was around the time of World War II. And that's when, uh, you know, Inuit were very nomadic people and they had seasonal hunting grounds and seasonal camps. And the government came in and because they wanted to make sure that they had uh, sovereign claims in the North, they rounded up Inuit families and just relocated them to random communities. Um, they, there's, there's so much that's not even in the film um, there's stories of uh, families' dogs being slaughtered by the RCMP with no explanation. Um, of course, uh, you know, there's been inquiries and there's the RCMP says, well, there, there was distemper. But, you know, the, the main point is that it wasn't whatever the reason was, it was never explained. And the same goes for taking children away and putting them in residential schools, which were run by churches. 
Um, you know, right. I can't speak to what the intent was, but it certainly wasn't communicated to families or people with uh, tuberculosis in communities being taken away uh, and never returning. Um, you know, this all happened in the last 50 years. And uh, uh, that was all, the, the original thing was land claims. Then during World War II and during the Cold War, uh, yes, there was, a, there was a very large defense portion of this. And uh, American, the American military came in and the dew line, the dew, uh, distant early warning system, that was really a, a big part of development across Nunavut. Um, and again, uh, incredibly disruptive to the culture and incredibly disruptive to, uh, to family bonds. And, and uh, one thing that is clear from my talking to people and I think comes across in the film as well is that you know, the, the trauma that was experienced, it's generational and it's passed down in, in multiple ways. Of course, uh, it's the same story in a lot of parts of the world. But um, uh, you know, when in the way of life, people were put in these communities uh, they were made to get uh, jobs so that they, they were um, made to rely on outside income sources. Uh, you know, they're, they were forced into um, uh, almost, uh, you know, cultural retraining to try and become, you know, the word is civilized, but I put that in quotes, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, uh, the effect um, is, is still lingering now and um, during land claims negotiations with the federal government. Obviously this whole other threat of climate change, all the opportunists who are coming in from the outside to try and make profit in the Arctic. I think there's a clash of worldviews and there's a clash of uh, uh, you know, incentive drivers and success models and success metrics because mm -hmm. uh, if you're measuring anything that has to do with people or the environment, against a quarterly earnings report, or in a lot of cases, an election cycle, obviously that's um, very extremely short-sighted. And I think one thing that a lot of indigenous groups have in common across the world, not all, but you know, many, is that uh, success is, or you know, success or something that's sustainable is sort of measured uh, in the long term. In indigenous communities that at least I've found to be true is that there's an idea that uh, you can't really call yourself successful or sort of elevate yourself to a higher status if the people in your community are suffering. I mean, I think there's a real focus on uh, together we prevail or together we, we sort of fall. Obviously, that's not the incentive in the rest of the world. I don't think that it ever will be. I mean, I would love it if things changed in that direction, but uh, I think uh, that might be an impossible uh, dream. But, um, you know, as long as... Uh, the sustainability of our uh, energy sources and, and, you know, the world is sort of tied to profit motives and short-term profit motives. I don't think we're ever going to get too far, but, you know, I hope that at some point there's a shift in, in that uh, from a, a business standpoint. What um, expectations or assumptions did you have going in that were revealed to be prescient and and what expectations did you have going in that were revealed to be not realistic to the situation? Well, I, you know, I tell myself that when I went up there for the first time, I was totally naive and knew nothing. Um, I'm sure I had some sort of implicit bias about, you know, what I might expect in the Arctic. Um, but in terms of, uh, in terms of expectation, um, you know, one thing that I think I thought when I first went up was that uh, Inuit had not been uh, part of the international fight for climate change or part of the international voice. Um, and to some degree, you know, they are marginalized on the international stage, but there's been huge political movement uh, in Nunavut and in Greenland um, the ICC is a, with the Internet Inuit uh, Circumpolar Council is a huge group that has done uh, some incredible work um, on the international stage in terms of uh, negotiating uh, rights and also um, things like uh, uh, having a chemical compound reduction in, in the rest of the world because a lot of the, the chemical runoff that is in our oceans makes its way up to the Arctic. Um, so that was one thing that I was surprised at um, and inspired by. In some ways, I had the advantage 
that so many filmmakers had done it incorrectly before me. And so, you know, in all the initial research, of course, like Nanak of the North comes up. That was uh, such a, a big one that kept coming up again and again and again as Inuit, Inuit themselves pointing to like, here's an example of someone coming in and, and sort of misrepresenting. And, and there's been a, I mean, that still goes on today. Mm-hmm. So I had uh, adopted from sort of day one, the mantra of just shut up and listen. That's my job when I go up. I am just there to learn. And, and then also I think that there's a, uh, I think that there's a tendency among filmmakers, maybe journalists as well, to go to areas like this and sort of talk to one person and then sort of extrapolate, um, okay, here's, well, here's what anyone would think about this and here's what anyone would think about that. But I also uh, made, made a, a sort of priority to never do that. One thing that was really, uh, I loved in a lot of the places I went to, actually almost every place I went to in uh, Inuit communities in the Arctic was the feeling of community. And that was something that at least I hadn't experienced or seen uh, in any of the places I've, I've lived, even in the very small town I grew up in. Um, it's sort of, you know, everybody uh, is looking out for one another. Everyone's uh, always gathering at one another's homes. Um, it's just open. Uh, even in, uh, in Nunavut, you can just walk into someone's house, um, you know, assuming you know them. Uh, nobody knocks. It's like one big sort of family feeling. And I think that sort of extends out to that uh, mentality I was talking about earlier of making sure everyone around you is okay. You know, you, you really, it's, it's sort of a shared well-being. And so I think that that's something I've tried to adopt into my own mentality. Uh, and thinking of ways that this film has changed me, I think that's, that might be a big one. You know, I can go up there a lot and sort of uh, feel like I'm understanding how things work and the way of life, but then also always trying to temper that with knowing, like, I'll never really understand uh, what it's like uh, to be um, Inuk or, you know, living in one of these communities or having gone through anything like this. So in some ways, uh, you know, it always feels a bit like uh, I always had two audiences in mind in my head when I was making this. There was uh, the world um, and people who have no idea that maybe people even live in the Arctic. And then the other audience was Inuit. And obviously that's two very, very different uh, audiences. But I always, I even had like the post-it notes up on my, uh, you know, computer while I was editing just to constantly be reminding myself of that. Um, but, you know, that was really important uh, to try and always be thinking through those, those two lenses.